Professor uh, William Chu is an associate professor in the Department of uh, Material Science and Engineering, a senior fellow of the uh, Precord Institute for Energy at the Stanford University and the faculty science at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. He leads a group of more than 30 researchers tackling the fundamentals of redox and, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, electrochemical processes in solid state. And uh, he directs Stanford's Storage X initiate that builds academic industrial partnership to accelerate the electrification of transportation and the penetration of intermittent renewable electricity in energy system. And he was a distinguished uh, Truman Fellow at the San Sandia National Laboratory and has received numerous uh, honors, including the Humboldt uh, Besser Award, MI Outstanding Young Investigator Award, and the uh, uh, Volkswagen Bus Science Award, Electrochemistry, uh, Solon. Uh, Research Fellowship, NSF Career Award, Solid State Ionics Young Scientist Award, Caltech Demetrates uh, Tassafa Cochalis Prize in Energy and the American Ceramic Society Diamond Award. In uh, 2012, he was named as one of the top 35 innovators on the age of 35 by M MIT's technology review. So uh, now uh, let's uh, welcome Professor William Chu and uh, his uh, talk today will be the dynamic load uh, local chemistry of castles during synthesis operations and aging. So now let's welcome. Thank you very much, Hai Tao. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you so much. And let me also add my congrats um, to uh, Xiangang. Uh, Li Gong for his uh, 85th birthday. Um, truly an honor to be part of this and it's a great pleasure to follow Ram, Cal, and Shirley uh, to talk about uh, battery materials chemistry. So I'm going to focus my talk today on the local chemistry of layer oxide cathodes specifically. And uh, many, maybe many of my colleagues do not know, I'm actually also a Chinese, uh, so I put my Chinese name there in case anybody wants to look me up. Um, so let me begin uh, just to motivate, and Cal and Ram have already said a lot about cathodes, so I'll just quickly go over this part. The main challenges for a cathode today is how to use all of the available lithium capacity in the system. Currently, we're only able to remove anywhere from 55 to 70 percent of the lithium, and the material becomes uh, unstable in the dilithiated state. And this is a result of two major phenomena. One is the disordering of the material when you remove the lithium from the van der Waals gap. And the second problem is that as you oxidize the material, the uh, materials becomes too oxidized such that the oxygen becomes unstable in this material and the oxygen comes out. So if you think about um, the defects that occur in the system, uh, you're dealing with not only uh, transition metal and lithium migration, but you're also dealing with oxygen vacancy formation due to the oxygen loss from the system. We have been very interested um, in thinking about point defects in layered materials for about a decade now. And um, if you take a look at the prototypical lithium cobalt oxide, um, you will see a wide range of defects involved. I'll go over them shortly. But actually, um, lithium cobalt oxide is also isostructural with nickel oxyhydroxide. Um, and I think some of you are also studying this for electrocatalysis applications, uh, and there, there are exactly the same challenges as well, although it's been used for proton storage uh, for catalysis and um, aqueous batteries. Some of the defects we can think about uh, in layer systems uh, could include uh, metal vacancies, so missing metals in the metal layer. You can also uh, think about uh, anti-side defect, for example, metal sitting in the lithium layer, of course, uh, you can also consider lithium sitting in the metal layer. And as I mentioned, missing oxygen atoms as oxygen vacancies. And these really give rise to very rich local chemistry, but also makes the system very challenging to understand. 
So traditionally, um, if you look at point defects in materials like, like layer oxides, the go-to strategy is really to think about them in a very dilute and non-interacting sense. And um, if you have taken a class on defect chemistry and point defects, uh, you're probably familiar with how to simulate the concentration of the defects, for example, as a function of temperature, as a function of lithium activity or oxygen activity. And here I'm just showing you some basic calculations. This is a plot of all the simulated defects in layer oxides as a function of the lithium activity. And if you simulate it as a function of the oxygen activity, there's even more regimes in here. This process actually works pretty well for most systems, but it makes two major assumptions um, that the defects are dilute in concentration and they're also non-interacting. The main challenges for layer oxides, especially for those containing lithium, is that there are many, many point defects, not just one, but several. They're typically non-dilute. So if you even think about lithium, it goes all the way from almost no lithium to full lithium per formula. The equilib equilibration time is very, very long. So it's hard to reach equilibrium. And also because it's at room temperature, um, the entropic forces would favor the defects to associate and interact, thereby forming these uh, interacting defect complexes. So these are some of the reasons why um, the defects are very hard to understand uh, in layer oxides. And that will be the main focus of my talk today is how do we understand point defects in layer oxides and how does that inform us to design more effective cathode materials that can have higher capacity and become more dilithiated uh, as you charge them. So as I mentioned, point defects are highly coupled. And let me give one example that we recently reviewed uh, in a review article. If you think about the layer oxide here, um, if you have every single element present, uh, no defects, this is your stoichiometric, say, lithium cobalt oxide. And if you introduce defect, for example, if you remove some of the metals and you form metal vacancies, um, they can be uh, disordered and exist anywhere in the system. And around those defects, you can also create new states. Um, for example, the oxygen near the metal vacancies would behave differently as if they are next to a pre-existing metal. So that introduces um, some complexity in the electronic structure. And if you further uh, consider additional defects. So in this case, if we remove some of the lithium, um, so you delithium the material, this is still in a um, non-interactive picture. So the lithium vacancy can exist independently of the metal vacancies. So the picture is pretty trivial from the second column. But the most interesting picture arises when the metal vacancies and the lithium vacancies sit next to each other. So this is a very simple example of defect interactions in which the lithium vacancies and the transition metal vacancy form a pair, and the pair are localized together. So this is essentially a Schottky defect pair, and this has significant consequences in the electronic structure because all of a sudden, um, the local chemistry around the lithium and the local chemistry around the metal are no longer the same as elsewhere in the system. So this is a simple illustration of how point defects can be coupled uh, in layer oxides. So for the talk today, I'm going to focus on a few systems. Um, one system is the lithium excess layer oxide. A second system I will focus is on a sodium layer oxide, um, and I will introduce them uh, throughout my talk. In the first case, um, lithium, layered, uh, lithium excess layer oxide has been invested quite substantially, actually, uh, by Michael Thackeray and Jeff Don uh, in the early 2000s, uh, followed by many others uh, of my colleagues in the field. In, in this system, uh, it's actually a very simple idea. You take a traditional layer oxide and you change the lithium to metal ratio. In a standard stoichiometric layer oxide, you have lithium to metal ratio of one to one. And in this case, if you think about lithium nickel oxide, as Ron presented earlier, then the nickel goes formally between the three plus and the four plus oxidation state uh, as you remove the lithium. But as you go to the lithium excess system, uh, one basically replaces some of the transition metal with lithium. So now you have lithium not only in the lithium layer, but also in the transition metal layer as well. And this changes the lithium to metal ratio from one to one to close to two to one. So this can effectively increase the energy density of the material because you're storing more lithium. 
But at the same time, you also need to ship the metal to higher oxidation state. So if you consider something like a manganese rich uh, nickel manganese cobalt oxide, um, the manganese typically stays in the four plus oxidation state. But now that means the nickel will have to ship to very, very high, so high oxidation state all the way from two plus to something above four plus. And it's not very clear how exactly this happens and what kind of a rearrangement the material undergoes. So that will um, be a bulk of my talk today. Now, one thing I do want to point out is there is a lot of misunderstanding in the field uh, that putting lithium, extra lithium into the material can give you far more capacity. This is actually not quite true. Uh, and the reason is actually very simple, is as you insert more and more lithium, you're also decreasing the amount of transition metal in the system. So that means where you could host the oxidation state change in transition metal previously, you now have to put them somewhere else. And the only other place um, to localize the oxidation is to put it on the N-ion. And essentially, if you substitute more lithium in for transition metal, you're shifting more and more of the redox capacity away from the transition metal into the N-ion, in this case, oxygen. And if you look at my plot here, actually your increase in the amount of capacity is pretty modest. It's only about 15% overall, but you're losing a lot of the transition metal oxidation state redox capacity. And that is because by substituting lithium into the material in the lithiated state, I have to start with higher and higher oxidation state of, um, of the transition metal. So you're not able to start from a low oxidation state. So this presents a substantial challenge because you're effectively not using all of the available uh, transition metal oxidation. But in exchange, you're able to use more of the anion redox, and that actually has a host of consequences as well that I will talk about in a bit. So one of the most impressive thing for these lithium excess layer oxides is that compared to something like a stoichiometric layer oxide, lithium cobalt oxide, or uh, stoichiometric nickel manganese cobalt oxide is that you can remove a lot of lithium without uh, significant consequences on the reversibility and cyclability of the material. So here I'm showing you nickel uh, lithium cobalt oxide, LCO, and if you remove all of the lithium in the system, uh, it quickly degrades. Uh, you cannot even cycle it more than 10 times uh, as you're approaching close to five volt in this particular system. But if you take the lithium excess material, like for example, manganese rich nickel manganese cobalt oxide, you can remove close to a formula ratio of one lithium per formula with very little consequence on the cycle life. So it has been shown both in academia and industry that you can get more than 1000 cycles, actually now the record, I think close to 1500 cycles of one formula lithium removal uh, per formula. Um, the only negative consequence is the very large uh, hysteresis that you see here, uh, which is still a problem that's to be overcome. And I'll talk about the origin of that in a little bit as well. So this is probably one of the most exciting aspects of lithium excess layer oxide is by simply replacing some of the transition metal with lithium, you're able to substantially increase the um, ability for the material to be stable in the dilithiated state. So now let's talk about the fundamentals of the point defects. So as we remove lithium in these lithium excess layer oxide, what is happening to the system? Well, what we know is that the oxidation state we access is very, very high. It's higher than what can be accommodated by the transition metal. So we have to think about this in terms of a high valent oxidation state. So high valent oxidation state means going above nickel four plus, going above iron three plus, going above manganese four plus, for example. And we have reviewed this recently in, in our paper I list below here in 2020, where we try to summarize what it means to access high valent oxidation state. So one of the best um, way to describe a high valent oxidation state is by the bond length. And in the layer oxide structure, there are two bond lengths which are very important. One is the oxygen-oxygen bond length, and one is the transition metal oxygen bond length. It's 2.8 and 2.0 Enstrom, respectively, in a standard octahedral environment uh, for a layer oxide like lithium cobalt oxide. And what happens as you access these very, very high oxidation state, you are removing more and more electrons from the transition metal oxygen 
octahedra, and this can lead to a substantial shortening of the bond distance between oxygen and oxygen, and also transition metal oxygen. So for example, uh, if you form these uh, highly hybridized uh, double bond between the transition metal and the oxygen, then the transition metal oxygen distance will go down from 2 to 1.8 to reflect the high oxidation state. And you can also actually get oxygen and oxygen get closer. Uh, in some cases, you can form a peroxide-like species, which is 1.5 angstrom. Others, um, such as our, um, our colleagues, um, um, Peter Bruce has also reported distance as short as 1.2 angstrom. And these are all reflections of the very strong covalent bonding, either between oxygen and oxygen, or the transition metal and the oxygen as the material gets very oxidized. So then this comes to some of the major consequence of accessing these very, very high oxidation state. As, as I said, again, nickel four plus is the limit for nickel. So going above nickel four plus will result in the following consequences. So first, as I mentioned, you will form this very strong covalent bonding between oxygen and oxygen and transition metal oxygen LS, illustrated by the short bond distance. So this is actually very favorable because once you form these strong bonding, then the energy is saved. So it substantially stabilizes the system. So you might ask, well, if this is such a good thing, why do we have so much problem with these high oxidation state? It is for the second reason I listed here is you access these very, very high oxidation state. The bond distance shortens because of covalent bonding, but then this also distorts the structure substantially. So as I illustrate on the top, you have substantial shortening of all the bonds. And because this is a periodic crystal, then these large local bond also strains the crystal. And this is a very destabilizing energy, a positive contribution to the free energy. So this is the major problem in these material. So at the end of the day, something else has to come in in order for us to achieve a net energy saving. And that's where point defects come in. So you have the bond distance shortening due to covalent bonding that saves energy, but the short bond distance also strains the crystal. So if you can rearrange the crystal through point defect disorder, such as moving the transition metals or the lithium around, this can then lead to overall energy savings. And this is our major finding for the field, is that you have to have these three things happen at the same time. Short bond distance, bond strain, and point defect disorder, they're coupled uh, all together when you access high oxidation state in layered materials. Uh, I also want to point out uh, that my colleague um, um, Anton Vindervan at UC Santa Barbara has also very nicely categorized the different types of rearrangement um, which can lead to energy saving, for example, transition metal migration, lithium migration, migration between octahedral and tetrahedral site, and various localization and delocalization of the hole that comes as a result of the oxidation. So I encourage you to review his recent paper um, as shown in the reference below. So let me give specific example of how this works for the layer oxides to give you our appreciation to the local chemistry and the point defect. In this case, I'm showing you what we have reported for the manganese rich uh, nickel manganese cobalt layer oxide cathodes. Uh, here, I'm showing you a top view and a side view of the layer oxide without any of the lithium uh, inside. Uh, this is shown without disorder, and the picture on the right shows it with a disorder. So the picture on the right shows one of the transition metal has moved into the lithium layer, resulting in a transition metal vacancy in the metal layer and an antisite lithium in the lithium layer. Um, and this essentially creates a local environment which is very, very unique um, in the layer oxides. And that's being highlighted in the red in the picture on the right. So when you move one of the transition metal um, outside of the uh, metal layer and into the lithium layer, you are left with these dangling oxygen. So these oxygen are no longer bonded to the same number of transition metal as to the ordered case on the left. So let me zoom in here. One of the oxygen, which is in red, is bonded to two transition metal uh, in this structure. But on the right, after you move the transition metal out of the way into the lithium layer, 
then those oxygen are only bound to one transition metal. And this actually allows um, the structure to be much more flexible because of the decoordination of the oxygen. Uh, so, so these are some calculations we have shown and also measurements we have done. If you take the picture on the left, the bond distance has no degree of freedom. It has to stay right around two n-strand between the oxygen and the metal. But once you move the transition metal out of the way, and creating these basically dangling oxygen or singly coordinated oxygen, then the bond distance can shorten much more dramatically. So here we can see bond lengths on the order of 1.6 and 1.7 between the metal and the oxygen. So effectively in inorganic chemistry, you would call this a metal oxospecies or double bonded oxygen between a metal and an oxygen. In defect chemistry, we can also think this as a complex. So it's a complexing of the oxidized oxygen with the transitional metal vacancy. So they have to be located closely together uh, in order to create this local environment, which benefits from the covalent bonding between metal and transition metal, uh, transition metal and oxygen to save energy. It creates the point defect, which costs a little bit of energy, but then the end result is you're able to accommodate the strain um, in the structure. So the three factors together leads to overall energy savings. So this entire picture I show here has an energy difference that's almost a zero electron volt. So although the picture on the right is a lot more defective than the picture on the left, it is actually almost as stable for the reasons I just described. This picture can also extend from low concentration of metal defects to high concentration of metal vacancy defects. So in the case of a low metal vacancy defect, then you form the short metal oxo species I just reported, where the metal oxygen bond is very short. But if you have enough of these transition metal vacancy around, you can say 20%, 30% of the transition metal has moved, then you can have the transition metal vacancy located next to each other. And we have shown that if you have enough of these metal vacancies around, then you can actually get the oxygen and oxygen distance to shorten as well. So basically, there are two dangling oxygen that are able to meet together. And this is how we can also identify metal, ox uh, metal peroxyl type species in which the oxygen-oxygen bond length is on the order of 1.4 enstrom. And these oxygen species have actually recently been reported uh, as well uh, by Peter Bruce's group. Uh, where they can see this spectroscopically and also via a neutron PDF refinement of the material. But what the main picture I want to convey here is the key ingredient is the point defects. Without the transition metal vacancy moving out of the way, it is not possible for the oxygen to be in a highly oxidized state. It is not possible for a short metal oxo bond to form. It is not possible for an oxygen-oxygen bond to form. The crucial player here is the metal oxygen, the metal vacancy. Uh, point defect. So let me now come back a little bit to material chemistry. So it turns out that this um, high oxidation state is extremely sensitive to the type of transition metal you have in the system. I don't have enough time to talk about the details, so I refer to our perspective article. It turns out by choosing the right transition metal, you can also switch between the various types of oxidized oxygen species between the metal oxo, between the oxygen-oxygen bonding, and everything in between. So essentially, this has to do with the relative energy of the transition metal and um, the oxygen. And this is actually beautifully shown by some of the early work from Ram and also from John Gunanoff, that by going between charge transfer insulators and Hubbard materials, you can actually rearrange the ordering uh, between oxygen and transition metal um, orbitals and leading to a very different behavior. So we uh, proposed how using different transition metal in the layer oxides can then lead to different types of oxidized oxygen behavior uh, and, and high valent behavior in the system. And this can, it's guiding us how to design material that can go to very high oxidation state. I should also point out that disorder rock salt uh, is also known to follow the same um, system as well. And there the defect chemistry is almost the same. And then um, others have also shown uh, that um, the periodic table is a rich playground for fine tuning these defect systems as well. Now, I said a lot about um, the manganese rich layer oxide. If you remember at the beginning of the talk, I highlighted one of the major disadvantages of the system. 
And the major disadvantage is that the hysteresis is very large. The hysteresis here is the difference between the charge and the discharge voltage. Um, no matter how slow you do it, the hysteresis is there. It's typically on the order of several hundred millivolts. Um, and you, you will have these at C over 100 or even a C over 1,000. Um, so it's a pseudo thermodynamic in origin. So uh, uh, several groups, including ours, have been looking into the origin of this um, hysteresis, and we have linked it back actually to this point defects. So the transition metal vacancy, um, when you take the lithium out, forms. But when you put the lithium back in, it likes to annihilate. So basically, the transition metal is moving back and forth between the lithium and the metal layer. And this is being shown by uh, in situ diffraction, in situ uh, exafs, and other structural probes that this is the origin of um, the hysteresis. At the same time, while it is a problematic thing, it is also a stabilizing thing. As I mentioned earlier, having the transition metals move around is what keeps the oxygen very happy in the system. So the key question we ask ourselves is, is it possible to have a material in which the transition metals do not move around? There are no transition metal vacancies, and yet you can keep the oxygen stable. This is a crucial question. So let me illustrate to you what I mean here. So currently with the manganese rich layer oxide, we're in the third column. So you have reversible or semi-reversible transition metal migration between the metal and the lithium layer, but this gives rise to a very large hysteresis gap, but the oxygen is stabilized as a result of this. So the oxygen doesn't come out like lithium cobalt oxide. But what we really want is the first column, which is no transition metal migration, and the oxygen is very stable in the system. And actually, there is only one system that has been identified so far that exhibit this very interesting and important um, behavior. That system is sodium manganese oxide, so sodium 2 manganese 307. This is a metal vacancy ordered layer oxide. Uh, uh, quite a few of our colleagues have worked on the system, um, uh, most notably uh, in France and also from the Oak Ridge team. Uh, and Linda Nazar and I have been working on the system for a number of years, and we were fascinated by it, both from a structure perspective, but also from the electrochemistry perspective. So briefly in the system, we have uh, transition metal um, missing, uh, one out of seven. And this leads to an order structure uh, as shown here. And what is incredible about the system is that if you only access the high valent oxidation states, so namely above manganese 4 plus, the system is entirely reversible. There is no hysteresis at all. So you can take a look at the electrochemistry on the right. Very unusual. So manganese is in the plus 4 oxidation state. You remove the sodium and the manganese oxygen bond distance and the oxygen oxygen bond distance both remain constant. So this is a system which are able to accommodate high valent redox beyond manganese 4 plus without oxidizing manganese. But at the same time, there are no formation of dimers, there are no formation of metal oxo species. And in fact, what the system seems to undergo is high valent redox involving only oxygen but without any of the structural consequences in the manganese rich system. And the electrochemistry, as I mentioned, speaks for itself in that there is virtually no hysteresis and no voltage fading, uh, which both are a significant problem with the manganese rich oxides. So what is happening in this system? It turns out the oxidized oxygen in the system is minimally covalent. So in the manganese rich layer oxide that I talked about previously, the oxygen-oxygen bonding and the oxygen-metal bonding are very covalent. That's why it's so stable, but the bond length are very short, thereby resulting in the strain in the lattice. In this particular system, we show that the oxygen are non-interacting at all. So as you oxidize oxygen, rather than want to pair up or to um, uh, covalent bond with the transition metal, they stay put. So the question is, why? And through a series of density functional theory calculation we have done using the HSC functional, we have shown that the oxygen and oxygen, the oxidized oxygen like to keep themselves apart. And this is a coulombic or electrostatic interaction. 
and that is very dependent on the locations of the oxidized oxygen. So we basically show that there is a preferential arrangement of these oxidized oxygen. If you keep them apart, it also prevents them from reacting with the one another to form oxygen-oxygen bonding. And let me just sort of skip to the end here for this particular um, result, and you can refer to uh, the paper that came out late last year. We are basically having an electrostatically ordered oxygen hole. So the oxygen holes are oxidized oxygen or O minus species, and they are prevented from reacting with one another through the transition metal vacancy. So the metal vacancy is basically templating the oxidized oxygen so it keeps apart. So you can see here in cyan, those are the negative charge uh, associated um, with the trans with the sodium vacancies, you can also see the positive charge associated with the oxidized oxygen, and they're very neatly arrayed in this system. This is the theoretical prediction, and we also see this experimentally as well. So in some of these um, layer oxides, we can see very strong spectroscopic signature for the formation of oxygen-oxygen dimers. So we can see this, for example, in the magnesium-rich um, uh, layer oxides, but in this particular system, we see no such signal at all. We actually see the signal corresponding to an oxygen minus, which is isolated. And on the bottom here, we are collab um, We have confirmed this via spectroscopic simulations as well, that the spectroscopic signal we see in the sodium manganese oxide actually correspond to a fully isolated O minus species. And this is a very, I think, significant um, discovery and understanding in this system, because now for the first time, we have a system that undergoes high valent oxidation, but without forming covalent bonding, and therefore bypassing all the structural consequences of high valent oxidation. So this is a very uh, neat system, and I, uh, I hope to intrigue others to look into it as well, and hopefully identify other related compounds uh, that exhibit this behavior. Now, the story doesn't end there. So I mentioned earlier, um, the system behaves this way because that um, the manganese vacancies are templating the oxygen holes. So in this case, we have to ask a very logical question. What if the manganese ions can also move around. So previously, I assumed that the manganese is not moving around. And experimentally, that is also what we saw is that the manganese um, cations do not like to move around in these um, sodium layer oxides. But in fact, they do move around. They just move around very, very slowly. Let me show you this energy landscape. So here I am showing you the energy landscape of what I've shown before. Um, the zero energy reference is the oxygen-oxygen dimer. So this is the oxygen peroxo bond. And then once you form this electrostatically ordered um, oxi oxidized oxygen, then you save about 0.2 electron volts. So this is good. This is what I've shown before. But this is assuming that you don't move the manganese cations around. If you move the manganese cations around, then you will save about 600 milli electron volt and you will also form the oxygen-oxygen dimer. So this is what I'm showing you on the right. So this is actually a very interesting story that the kinetic of slow transition metal migration in the sodium layer oxide, which is quite well known because of the prismatic structure in the sodium layer, slows down the manganese mag um, cation migration. And because of this, it's very difficult to access the lowest energy state which unfortunately is also the oxygen-oxygen dimer formation. So in this system, we have the scenario where we have a kinetically stabilized oxygen minus, which does not distort the lattice. But if you let the material sit around long enough, this will happen. We are showing that this is happening around 100 hours. So if you keep the material in the oxidized state, after about 100 hours, the, sodium, um, the manganese cations will move and the oxygen will dimerize, and that will result in substantial structural rearrangement, just like the magnesium-rich system. So um, again, this is a very complex system, but I think very worthwhile of folks' attention to look at it. Now, to conclude my talk in the next five minutes or so, uh, I want to touch upon briefly about yet another kind of point defect. So we talked about transition metal vacancies, we talked about 
metal in the lithium layer. And one other defect, which is hugely important in layer oxide, is oxygen vacancies. And this has been a somewhat controversial topic um, over the years because they're very hard to quantify in layer oxides. And I'm going to show you some of the studies we have done in the magnesium rich layer oxides to show how um, the oxygen loss in the system can be adequately described as oxygen vacancies uh, structurally. So just to remind you what happens in the system is that as you cycle the battery, um, you will suffer voltage fading. So the voltage fades by about three to 400 millivolts over about a thousand cycles. So this is very problematic. Um, the reason is actually fairly well understood. It's because you are transitioning from nickel uh, redox into manganese redox, and the manganese redox sits at about three volts, and that's why um, the system is losing voltage. So this is due to um, something happening in the material that causes it to become progressively more oxidized. And there are several reasons for this. Um, so if we think this is due to oxygen loss, it actually corresponds to about 3% of oxygen being lost from the system, which is quite a bit for a layer oxide. What is also very interesting is that while the oxygen is being lost, the transition metal is also getting stuck. So I mentioned previously for the manganese rich material, the transition metal goes back and forth uh, between the metal layer and the lithium layer. But as you lose oxygen in the system, what happens at the same time is that the transition metal gets stuck in the lithium layer, it doesn't come back. And you can see this on the plot on the right, that the transition metal disorder goes from about 3% in the pristine material all the way to about 10% after 500 cycles. So this is also telling us something is happening in the material to trigger the voltage decreasing and the transition metal getting stuck. So what is this missing picture here? Well, it turns out this has everything to do with how oxygen loss is accommodated in the system. Um, those familiar with the layer oxides uh, know that there are two ways to accommodate oxygen loss. The first way is called um, the oxygen vacancy pathway, which is what I will talk about next. This basically assumes that oxygen is lost and, um, and they are missing in the lattice and you have um, oxygen vacancy um, staying on as point defects. But it can also be accommodated via a second pathway called the densification pathway, which basically says oxygen is lost from the system, but then the transition metal and the lithium move around and some of the lithium is lost from the structure in order to compact the lattice again. So both of them will give exactly the same result in terms of the oxidation state. It will lead to an overall a more reduced material. You will also measure oxygen being lost from the system. So the number of oxygen atoms is the same in both structure. The difference is the amount of lithium, and also the difference is um, the uh, presence of oxygen vacancy. And of course, uh, at the, at the most important part is the density of the materials different. So using uh, density measurement through pycnometry by studying the amount of lithium that stays in the material, we conclude that the densification is not operative here. What is happening is that the oxygen is leaving the material, lithium is staying put, transition metal is staying put, and then you have a oxygen vacancy structure. And if you're not completely convinced yet, um, we have also done some very nice um, microscopic imaging of oxygen vacancies. So here we're imaging manganese oxidation state uh, at the primary and secondary particle level. So here the picture is showing you primary grains of manganese rich NMC. And you can see in the pristine material, the entire material is in the four plus oxidation state. But as oxygen evolves and it leaves behind oxygen vacancies, then the manganese oxidation state slowly shifts down to three plus. And even just after one cycle, you have already lost quite a bit of oxygen vacancy, but they're lost around the surface. But then as time goes on, um, the oxygen vacancy penetrate deeper into the material. And if you look at the picture on the right after 125 cycle, you can see a substantial penetration of oxygen vacancy. So this really contrasts with the classical understanding that the oxygen is only lost from the surface. Actually, oxygen is lost from the surface on first cycle, but subsequently, oxygen is also slowly diffusing 
um, into the structure or analogously oxygen is diffusing out of the material. So here we have also offered a really direct measurement of the oxygen diffusivity by profiling the manganese oxidation state. And we estimate a very quantitative number for the oxygen diffusivity. It's about 10 to the minus 17 centimeter score per second. This is a very small number, but for lithium ion battery cathode, it is not small at all. The reasons are twofold. One, the transport distance is very short. You can see here the primary particles are about 200 nanometers. And secondly, the time is very long, right? For a battery material, 125 cycle will take about a thousand hours to complete. So couple the two together, short transport distance, long time, then gives you a very big problem with oxygen being lost from the system. So now we have this very complete picture of why the voltage is fading. The voltage is fading because the oxygen lost from the system is shifting your Fermi level down. Okay. Um, so this is, uh, sorry, the shifting the Fermi level up. So as you lose oxygen in the, in, in, as you're charging and discharging the material, your Fermi level is rising. And this eventually reaches the manganese redox state, causing the material to um, lose voltage and accessing the low voltage three volt redox couple. But more importantly, there is a consequence on the structure. So I mentioned earlier, when the oxygen vacancy is being formed, it also seems like the transition metal is getting stuck. Uh, and this actually was first proposed by Shirley many years ago that the transition metal vacancies uh, and oxygen vacancy can also interact. So let me describe this briefly. When you form an oxygen vacancy in a system, it actually would like to be very close to a transition metal vacancy because you are losing one oxygen to a transition metal O6 octahedra. So if you form an oxygen vacancy, that's a very unhappy, you know, manganese O5. So the way to make it happier is to push the metal away so that the transition metal vacancies is next to an oxygen vacancy. And this essentially is a, a coupled shocky defect pair. And this can explain why, as the material ages, as it loses oxygen, then the transition metal is also getting stuck uh, in, in, the, um, uh, in the lithium layer in order to keep the oxygen vacancy stable in the system. So um, let me also just show you how severe this problem is. Um, this is a very simple calendar aging study we have done. Um, Calendar aging is very, very common for anodes, but it's less common for cathodes. And here, what we have done is simply hold um, the manganese-rich uh, nickel manganese cobalt oxide at a high potential uh, at different states of dilithiation. So here, I'm showing you progressively more and more charged material, and we're just monitoring how the voltage is changing. So if you only cycle it to 4 volts, um, the material barely loses voltage. But if you cycle it to 4.4, 4.5 volt, then you can actually lose about 300 millivolt just over 100 hours. And this voltage loss um, is a direct indication of transition metal migration and also oxygen vacancy loss as well. So how, how bad is it? After 100 hours, we will lose about five milliliter of oxygen gas per gram of NMC. For calibration, this is more than the volume of the electrolyte in the material. So these materials are known to gas on first cycle, but what we are showing here is that you will also gas slowly over time, and this will make an implementation in the pouch cell very, very challenging. And this foliage fade can occur without any cycling whatsoever. This is actually just cycling the material one time to a high voltage. And this points to the importance of coding, um, as Cal was mentioning earlier, to really control not only the reactivity with the electrolyte, but also the ease of oxygen leaving from the system, especially for a material that's in the high valent oxidation state. So my time is up. Just to summarize um, the talk here, we have talked about various contributions to high valent oxidation, uh, covalent bonding, local distortion, point defects, and then finally electrostatic interactions between the defects. And then in the second part of the talk, oxygen loss is very critical uh, for the high voltage stability of this material and can be traced to the formation of oxygen vacancies, even though they barely migrate based on the operating environment of a cathode, they are very, very important. 
and cannot be ignored. So I'd like to thank everyone who have contributed to this work, especially my colleagues, uh, Tom Devro, Linda Nazar, Get Seder, and others uh, who have contributed to this work uh, and also uh, funding from industry, mostly from BSF and also from the Department of Energy. And thank you very much for listening. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor William Chu for, uh, for your uh, nice uh, talk. So uh, due to the time limitation, we can only have one very short question. Uh, any questions? Can I ask the question? Yes. Yeah, Will, great talk. Uh, thank you so much. I think it, um, I learned quite a lot from your recent work. Um, my question to you is the impact of electrolyte. Obviously, all these um, highly activated states of the uh, oxygen, even though in solid state, um, we don't know much about their compatibility with electrolyte. I wonder if you can comment on that. Yeah, I think this is a very big problem um, because our standard picture of electrolyte stability doesn't care about oxygen quite yet. Because if you look at some of uh, Huber Gasteiger's work, it really focuses on the first cycle. But what we're showing here is oxygen is slowly creeping out. And I believe this will require more engineering um, in terms of oxidative. You don't use any special additives in your electrolyte, just the, the standard Gen 2 electrolyte. Now here we are using some um, additives to deal with oxidation stability, but these are your standard high voltage electrolyte. But I ah. think high voltage is referring to one problem. Oxygen from the cathode is another problem, which comes Absolutely. with high voltage. So for example, there are high voltage material like spinel that doesn't lose oxygen. So it's, a, it's two kinds of problem. I'm afraid that this is just making it even harder. Thank you, excellent. Thanks very much. Thank you, Shirley. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Chu, uh, once again for your uh, nice talk.